But today I'd like to introduce Nancy Polk. Um, she is the curator of coastal history. Curator of coastal history. She's been working with the collection since 1984, although back then it was still at the National Museum of American History. She curated many of the exhibitions that opened this museum 24 years ago. Yeah. Um, she's curated a number of exhibitions here, uh, not just the opening one, but many you'll see uh, down here, such as Systems at Work, and the most recent temporary exhibition, which is down more or less at the bottom of those escalators on mail trolleys, and that's what she's here to speak about today. So I'll let her take it. Take 
the concept of the train and put it into the trolley. So they didn't have the right equipment, it wasn't the right size, it was big for a train, not small for the trolley. So there was a lot of going around and figuring out what they were doing and what sizes were big. So the very first car that comes out in St. Louis cost $4,000. That changed as they figured out what they were doing and everybody got the idea and, and companies would basically steal from other ideas from other companies. So the cars got a lot cheaper as they went along. Inside the common <coughs> cars, it's pretty much the same thing you saw inside the rail car. You've got a guy standing up, two, you'd have maybe one clerk, two clerks, three, not too many. The trolley cars were smaller, remember. And they'd be standing up, sorting the mail, from the pouches into the pigeonholes, and then put the pigeonholes back in the pouches, wrap it up and get it ready to, to move out. The clerks would be operating at eight hours a day, which was fairly standard for clerks at that point, and $700 a year. Because they needed people who knew what they were doing, they hired from the railway mail service. They didn't take clerks out of the post offices, they took them off the trains. And at first that was a bit of an issue, because the clerks didn't like leaving the trains. They were very happy doing the, the, their work. They had weird hours and days. They would work five or six or seven days in a row. Then they might get five or six days off. Uh, maybe they would work eight days in a row and get three days off. Uh, sometimes, or a lot of times, they would work um, three or four days on one line, so they're staying in little hotels along the way. So, I mean, the clerks that loved this life, that were really into it, didn't necessarily want to go onto a trolley car because, you know, it's not the romance, it's not as much fun. But I gotta tell you, the wives were a determining factor. Wives got their husbands home every night. <laughs> wives liked the Easter bus. So a lot of the guys that went from the railway mail cars into the trolley cars were married guys. And here again you can see inside the car and you can see the light up at the top. When you're looking at um, photographs, old photographs of the inside of these cars, because they look so much like a train car, you can't necessarily tell the difference. But if you look at the top, you can see the, the top molding that is the pretty typical of the street cars. Over on the side there, something that's very special for the electric trolley cars and very helpful for the clerks, and that's an electric canceling machine. These are machines that they stand on a pedestal, and so the clerk, instead of having to by hand cancel each thing, can actually run them through the machine and get them done a lot faster. So the clerks really enjoyed if you could plug into the electricity and use the electric machine. Brooklyn was the next city to get trolley mail service. They began their service in 1894, while Brooklyn was still a separate city. They didn't uh, merge into New York City until uh, 1898. And you have the trolley car here that was kind of a half and half. Again, they're first starting out this service, they don't quite know what they want to do with it. And so the first cars for some of these cities were what they called half and half. And that meant half the trolley car, top one you would see three-fourths of the trolley car was for passengers and the other half or one-third of that or whatever was for the um, clerks to sort the mail, process mail. And you think, okay, that's a great system, you know, you, if you don't need all the room for one or the other. The problem was they didn't have the same needs of where they wanted to stop or needed to stop. The clerks had to stop at certain places um, to make connections for post office or trains. They also would stop to get mail out of collection boxes. There were special collection boxes that were targeted to work with these, so they'd need to stop those boxes and get the mail. Well, those weren't passenger stops. So the passengers, like, we're wasting our time while this guy goes and gets the mail. So the passengers are getting upset. In the meantime, when they're stopping for the passengers, the clerks are like, I need to get this connection made. You know, the train's gonna leave and we're stopping for all these two passengers. <coughs> so it got to be very frustrating for both groups. And every city tried a half and half. Just about every city tried a half and half. Most of them switched over to full mail car 
because it was just very frustrating for everybody. This is uh, one of the few New York cars that said New York only had the service for five years. And something to note on these cars is you can see at the very top that little the kind of black rectangle um, that's a blow up of the car itself. That is a mail slot. So in addition to the clerks working the mail that's already been given to them in the pouches, they could work the mail that was being tossed into the train as the train was stopped at all the various places. People would come up and, and put their letter in that. What the people also did, I forgot to mention on the half and half bars, is people might have postcards and other things with them. Um, they would just finish writing the postcard, put a stamp on it, and then knock on the door for the clerks and then pass it under or over the car or come out and put it into the thing. So you had people putting mail into the cars in a lot of different ways. Um, if I could have some help from one of our lovely assistants, okay, um, could you push on the streetcar mail card? This is one of the Washington, D.C. streetcars. Yeah, that kind of one. Hopefully it should play. It shows here this is Pennsylvania Avenue at 12th Street in D.C. Uh, those who don't know D.C., this is where the Trump Hotel is now, just outside that area. And you see a postal clerk with his wagon, his green wagon with some mail, waiting for his uh, streetcar to come. And you see the streetcar, same design as the one right there. It might even be the same one. This is interesting because this is a double. This is a passenger car first, and then it's tied to a streetcar in the back. So this is, in fact, two cars traveling at once. So you take the mail out of the, the mail car. Passengers are supposed to sit and wait for this to happen. It takes a little longer this time, I think, because it's all being filled. So he grabs the bags and puts them into the, the back of the wagon. And now the streetcar can take off. And he now takes off with his pouches full of mail. And he heads straight to the train station, where we don't really see too much, but he'll end up at the train station. And that mail is now had been sorted and it's ready to go on the train. And it could be ready for the very next stop, New Carrollton or, or whatever a stop might be on this particular train. The Boston streetcars, I gotta admit, this Boston streetcar is my favorite car. I think it's the most beautiful of them all. Um, some of these streetcars are so elegantly decorated on the outside, so gorgeous. This particular car, 642, uh, since it was my favorite car, I actually looked into the history of it. And it started out as a horse passenger car, as a lot of them had. And then it moved from uh, horse drawn to electric. And then it became the closed mail pouch car, which is you just uh, put the closed pouches on the car. Then it became an open uh, pouch car with the mail clerks on board sorting it. And then they had this car and they wanted to sell it. The company did. These cars did not belong to the post office. They belonged to the companies that had built them and were contracting with the Postal Service. So anyway, the company now had this car. The Postal Service didn't want it anymore. They didn't want to spend the money to turn it back into a passenger car. So they sold it to the Boston Globe. And the Boston Globe used it to deliver newspapers <laughs> up and down. Now Chicago have a couple of interesting cars here. And the one I want to Far side, the color uh, red is the same as the picture above it, car number six. And the coloring is very important, and we'll get to that also down the road. But these cars were all painted white, most of them with gold lettering, um, some red, some blue, but they were all white. Every mail car that you had was white. And you have this particular car, which actually was restored, it was held onto by the Chicago Transit Authority. And then um, the Fox River Trolley Museum in South Elgin, Illinois, has it at the moment. This car, before it went to them, was up for grabs. And our director, the museum's first director, when we were putting this place together, put in a bid, was trying to get this car. And we were all very excited, like, we're going to get the trolley car. We, <coughs> we have no place to put it. You know, but we're not thinking that. We're just thinking we want the car. And they turned around and said, this is how we're leaving Chicago. 
for Illinois. So, you know, we're going to blame the Illinois people here for, <laughs> for us not getting the trolley car. But again, if we had gotten it, you wouldn't see it anywhere because we'd have to put it in storage and, you know. So at least now people can see it. So reluctantly, I guess it's okay. And we want to talk about some wet and um, in the rules of trolleys. Before mail trolleys were carrying the bags of mail from one post office to the other or between uh, post offices and train stations, wagons were carrying it. And these also were contracted. So we contracted the guy, he had five or six wagons, load them up with mail bags, take them to wherever he needed to take them. When the trolley cars came in, he was out of a job. So some of these wagon guys were very, very unhappy. And there was one in particular who decided that he was so unhappy that he actually had his wagons transporting beer for a, um, for a brewery, and he decided to show his unhappiness while he pulled his wagon in front of the mail trolleys and ordered the drivers to go very, very slowly so that the trolley couldn't go at its regular speed. And he did this five or six days in a row, and finally the post office complained to the mayor, complained to the police, the chief, chief of police, and so the next time one of his drivers tried that, they arrested him for interfering with the mail, and he didn't do it anymore. Philadelphia has a couple of um, interesting trolleys. The one that's on the left that has the number to it is a city trolley. The one on the right that is uh, M1 is a trolley for the suburbs. Not all towns had the trolleys that would go all the way out to the suburbs, but Philadelphia did. And the suburb one was a different company. You can see it's a completely different design and different numeration. Companies would have different numbers for their um, trolley cars. One company might use alpha, alpha just A, B, C, D. One alphanumeric like this M1, others just by numbers and it really depended on the company and what they wanted to do. But in this case in Philadelphia, you could tell by the number of the trolley and the style, whether it was suburbs or cities. And I just love this quote about the interior of the car. This is one of the first cars when the newspaper was talking about it. It said the interiors are lighted by six 16 candle power electric lamps. They are much better lighted than the common cars this being necessary for the handling of mail. So it's, these were operating into the night. Sometimes they would operate, you can see headlights on some of them, operate as late as midnight, 1 a.m. So light was very, very important, not just during the day, but in the evenings for the clerks to see what they were doing. Cincinnati um, has a couple of fun cars here. The one, again, that's up at the top is a Suburban car, the one that, that's the drawing, sorry, and the one here that's the photograph, is a city car. And one thing you might notice for all these photographs is the mail clerk is always posed in the middle door, always with a bag, mail bag. It's like they, they have to have their mail bag in their photo, otherwise they're not postal employees, I don't know. But there were usually three, um, at least three employees on any of these cars. The conductor, the motorman, and the postal clerk, which, as I said before, there could be one clerk, two clerks, three clerks. But there was always a motorman, and you see him at the front, ready to get the thing running, and the conductor in the back. The conductor and motorman worked for the company, not for the post office. And because of that, they did not get to go inside the car. The interior of the car, especially when they were sorting mail, was only for the clerks. Nobody else was allowed in. In San Francisco, you can see here in the coloring of the car, the white cars with the gold lettering and the gold symbols. And if you want to hit the... Thank you, Katie. This is a video of... Oh, wait a second, one second, sorry. This is a video taken in 1906. It's in San Francisco on Market Street. Uh, you can find it online. The original is like about 12 minutes long, and I don't want to do that to you. Um, it's called The Trip Down Market Street, 1906. And 
I just want to show you a part because you get an idea of just the traffic involved in these and the speed of, of these. The camera was put on the front of a trolley car. So this was just to show how a trolley car moves right. in the city.
So instead of having 900 and 901, they went for M to a I mean, who, who knows what numbering system that, that had to do. It may have had to do with their trains that they had or other something else, but when they bought the cars, they changed the, the numbers. Seattle um, had a trolley car system, and uh, they only had one car at first. They figured that was all they needed, not a problem. And then around 1907, they started thinking, you know, we're going to have this Alaska Yukon Expo in two years. I bet there's going to be more people. I bet that means more mail. I bet that means we need a second car. So, you know, the, the post office was thinking, or post office had to think ahead, is there any particular reason that my city is going to have an influx of people or an influx of mail? And they had to address it a couple years ahead because, you know, it took a while to build one of these cars. Cleveland was the last city to get it. Didn't get the service until 1908. They didn't held on to it until 1919, which was the same year that it, it ended. Um, I'm from the West. We call these things in front of the, the, we call those cattle catchers. There's no cattle in Cleveland that I know of. <laughs> Um, but they still have these, and you probably saw them in a lot of the other cities. But you notice again from that video I showed you of San Francisco, of all this stuff happening in front of a car. So this was a good protector to make sure to brush people aside, brush maybe a wagon or a horse or whatever aside. You know, just keep sure that whatever's in front of you is not going to get under the car, but kind of move. One of the um, dangers of this were the strikes. There were a lot of strikes in the late 19th century, early 20th century um, that were targeted to the trolley companies. The trolley companies, railway companies. Um, this was an era of strikes, period. There were four strikes in particular that happened in cities that had trolley cars at that time. San Francisco was incredibly a violent strike. 31 people in that in that transit strike and over a thousand injured. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, the other three were not as bad, but the strikes could be pretty violent, pretty bad. These two illustrations that are on the left are from Harper's, from the Brooklyn strike, and you can see the police are in the guard are trying to get that one mail car through in the bottom picture. The top picture is not a mail car, it's just a regular trolley car. We talked about the cars being put in white. This comes into play in the strikes. During the trolley strikes, nobody hated the post office. They hated the trolley companies. They didn't hate the post office. So they let the white cars through. If the people, as you can see, were all lined up there, They'd open up, they'd let the car through. Well, in San Francisco, one of the companies got the smart idea, let's paint our trolleys white. Most trolleys, you know, were green, red, blue, let's paint it white. So they painted their passenger car white, and they got a couple through until the post office found out about it, and they were going to step in, and the law was laid down, and no car except a postal car could be white. So after that, they had to go back to their regular colors and have the issues with the strikers. Sometimes even being painted white didn't matter. The photograph on the right is from St. Louis, the St. Louis strike. And in this case, what the strikers did was they laid down railroad ties along the um, track. So what you see here is basically the conductor having to get out, move the tie one by one as the trolley goes down. Now, obviously nothing lasts forever, and the trolley cars had had their day, but they did start to see decline, and there were a few different reasons. Uh, we talked about New York City only having their service for five years. One of the reasons is this picture up the top left. Yes, they had a pneumatic tube service, which was underground mail service that was incredible. And that really took a lot of the, the mail, and they really didn't need the trolleys quite as much as some of the other cities. So 
that kind of killed the, tr the trolley service for New York City. I don't know are the other cities, the thing that really did it was 1913, there was a law called the Parcel Post Legislation. Uh, beginning in January 1st, 1913, the Postal Service finally let you send things in the mail up to about 50 pounds. Before that, it was just four pounds. You really couldn't send anything. Well, Parcel Post just exploded in the Postal Service. People were sending packages all the time. And the Postal Service started looking at these newfangled things called trucks. They didn't want to go back to the wagons, but the trucks had promise. And you can see here the truck on the top right, la actually labeled the Parcel Post truck um, down on the right. So these are trucks that are basically just designated for the Parcel Post service. The trolley cars couldn't handle Parcel Post because instead of getting 20, 30 bags of mail, they might get one bag of letter mail and then these tons of packages. And that's just clogging your system up. So they just wasn't working very well. And you have this nice picture of a letter carrier with all the packages waiting for his truck to come and, and pick them all up. Is that the post office building in the old post office in Washington? The, the one on the far? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the one above. Yes. Oh, the, one, the one on the top. The, 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 the Trump, Trump, way? Trump Hotel. <laughs> that would be both, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting.
I'm gonna guess and say the answer varies on city and you know if it's through versus local and all that sort of stuff. But can you give an average of how many um, how many times they would make the laps of the route within that eight hour work period? Well, the eight hour work period is just for the clerks. Okay. The trolleys sometimes could go 12, um, 14 hours. So you might have one or two shifts of clerks on them. Uh, the trolleys started early in the morning. And I'm, I've seen schedules where they're, you know, five, four in the morning, and they go you know, midnight, one a.m. So the, the trolleys were running all a lot. I haven't seen any place that was all all day, you know, twenty four hours a day. They did have different schedules in most cities. Um, <coughs> Friday was the busiest schedule. Then Saturday, and then Sundays. They're still operating on Sundays and sorting the mail on Sundays, but not as often. They, they might have 12 runs on a Monday through Friday. They might have two on a Saturday and one on Sunday. Could you list the five? That's right, let's have some of it, sorry. Nancy, it's not your provenance, but what were the, what were the trolley riots all about? What were the trolley you riots? You referred to, to the riots that were going Oh, the on. riots? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think they were all, all riots that were about a bad day, labor, um, working hours, money. And I honestly don't know what made the San Francisco one as violent hmm. as it was. I've not done research on that. Uh, but I, I was astounded to learn that there were 31 people killed wow. in that one. That was, that was amazing. <coughs> Thank you. First of all, there's a paper on the San Francisco uh, strike riots. Okay. And then at railways was incredibly anti labor. And they would not compromise. And they won the strike, if I recall correctly. And it was, as you correctly put, very, very blunt. The Bay Area uh, Electric Railway Association uh, had a seminar and published that work, which I probably all read it myself. And could you list the five? I know only two RPOs. I've drawn post offices. I'm curious what the others are. I'd have to look. I know there's five. But there is there is an, an urban one that uh, in the Chicago South Shore South Bend. Uh, in the Indiana Railroad, in the Chicago South Shore South Bend, uses a line car, a maintenance car. And after 60, 70 years of use, and so it's being used up as an RPO. Uh, that's only an urban one that I know. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Sir? Yeah. Go ahead.